My name is Stephen Long, and I host a show here on Rock Candy called Sacred Tension, the podcast about the spiritual discipline of asking questions. We cover topics from LGBT issues to faith and doubt and mental health. We talk to biblical scholars and have conversations about religious abuse and leaving faith and finding it again. We also talk to pastors and skeptics and cult experts who are all sorting out their own journey of faith. Please join me in these conversations on Sacred attention right here on Raw Candy. Welcome to the Eleventy Life Podcast. What's up, everybody, and welcome to this week's episode of Eleven D Life. I could not be happier that you are here with us this week. We have an absolutely amazing show planned for this week and there's somebody who I am really excited to introduce you to but first I want to give huge hugs and high fives to everybody who is absolutely destroying this Kickstarter campaign that we have for our brand new album called Basic Glitches Um, this episode is going to air probably right in the middle of that campaign as of right now I think there are eight days left in it possibly fewer you guys completely funded up the entire release of this album in three days in a single weekend you guys destroyed this kickstarter and we could not be more grateful thank you so much to everybody who's contributing to that campaign you have no idea what it means to us it literally puts gas in the tank for everything that we're doing here with 117 and with rock candy it really moves the needle. So if you are a listener to the show, you enjoy what we do here, you enjoy the music that we make, but you've been sitting on the sidelines until now, not really wanting to get both feet in the water, now is the time to do it. Go check out this Kickstarter campaign. We have some super sweet ways for you to pre-order this new record from us. And every single person that decides to moves the needle for what we're doing here at Rock Candy and with 117. Oh yeah, not to mention every single person that backs us in this Kickstarter campaign also gets entered to win a custom Korg monologue synthesizer that we had especially made and themed after this new record. It looks super cool and awesome. You should check that out on our Instagram page if you haven't seen that yet already. Also, all of our backers for this Kickstarter campaign get access to music earlier than everybody else does. So for instance, we have a brand new single called Killing My Vibe coming out at the end of this month on November 29th. If you're backing the Kickstarter right now, you already have access to it. And uh, yeah, it will absolutely change your life for better or for worse, uh, we have no control over. (laughs) So much love and unicorn emojis to everybody who is making that happen for us. Seriously, you guys are absolutely the best. Hey, we have an episode to do. I'm excited about introducing you all to a fellow member of the Rock Candy podcast community. His name is Peterson Toscano. He is a great friend of ours and an incredible contributor to the work that we're doing here at Rock Candy. He describes himself as a quirky, queer, Quaker climate activist. He has a really, really fun show on Rock Candy called Bubble and Squeak, and you're going to find out all about it in this week's episode. But if you want to check out what he's doing and the kind of work that he's doing, go ahead and click on his website. You can get to it directly in the show notes here. I promise that you will not be disappointed. We got to have an amazing conversation. He is absolutely one of my favorite people to talk to you about gender and religion and climate change. And he has some amazing thoughts uh, about this that he wraps up oftentimes into plays that he does. Uh, he's also a, quite an accomplished playwright. In fact, my first experience with him was seeing a play that he was performing. It was a one-man play at a festival that we played this past summer, and I was absolutely spellbound. He was amazing. Anyway, how about we tune on into the actual conversation that we have with him? So let's get on with it. Thank you you guys so much for being here. Thank you for all of the love and good vibes and positivity that you guys send our way. And a huge thank you to everybody once again, who's contributing to our Kickstarter campaign. You guys make being in this band and being a part of Rock Candy one of the funnest things I've ever done in my life. Sincerely owe that to all of you. So uh, from me personally, you have all of my gratitude. And uh, yeah, let's do another podcast episode. Well, how have you been, man? What have you been up to? 
I am the activist in residence at a university near my house for the entire semester. So I get to be on campus, teach classes, meet with students, infuse the whole place with creative activism. Wow, that sounds like the best job in the world, especially for somebody like you, because you exude yeah. this kind of joy um, about talking about activism. <laughs> yeah, and, and I make sure that people understand that I'm an introvert and I'm shy by nature, which people don't think of goes with activism. Uh, and so that helps a lot because I think, you know, I'm trying to deconstruct what it means to be an activist, that you can be a shy, artistic person and do really good activism. Well, I can totally relate to that because I feel like you, I feel like it's the introverted part of yourself that holds you up, you know, in a basement or in a studio or a bedroom for hours on end, thinking through all kinds of, uh, all kinds of issues and kind of like just committing yourself to the madness process of being alone with your brain um, and I feel like that's where that's where most of the of the magic happens that's where you kind of get the opportunity to kind of coalesce your thoughts to to connect the dots a little bit um, I'm totally I'm totally that way I'm way more comfortable in the studio than I ever am on stage for sure yeah, yeah and that's why I like podcasting and doing audio production is so great because it is perfect for introverts we get to just sit in this world that's mostly quiet <laughs> <laughs> except for the noises we make <laughs> yes yes i feel like i always have to remind myself of that like we did a show this past weekend and i've been doing that like i've been playing shows since i was 15 and there's like a certain amount of comfortability that you get in front of an audience but that comfortability manifests itself in like a physical way so you can look physically comfortable but you still have all this introverted brain activity going on behind the scenes and so a lot of times you don't realize like how draining it is to just be around people not that people are awesome and empowering in a lot of different scenarios. But I, I think I realized that when I was talking to some some fans that came to the show and I, I felt like I might have been a little bit awkward or I was <laughs> I was way overthinking the conversation I was having with them or you feel the need to also entertain if you know that yeah, people are there to yeah. see you perform or do something. Do you ever experience that? Uh, yeah, all the time. In fact, in fact, one of the strangest feedbacks I get from people regularly is how comfortable I look in my own skin when I'm on stage, which <laughs> is not at all how I experience it. <laughs> it's not how I'm feeling, but it's because you have to put on this. It's not uh, it's not fake. It's real but like it's it's i have a role to play and as an introvert yeah. when i have a role then i'm good that's why like when i go to a party i give myself a job this is how i get through parties oh this is otherwise, interesting otherwise i'm freaking out so what i do is my job is to get people's coats or to find out if people need a drink and the host will often say like uh you don't actually need to do the dishes or whatever the job is and i was like actually <laughs> i do peterson otherwise, would you I mind would putting be... our vacuum cleaner up we it's we already have the radio going it's we don't need background noise from you <laughs> and so i think it's like that like on stage and it is when i get off stage and people have questions and they want to talk I have to kind of stay in the performance mode or else I'm not really prepared for, for that because I'm, you know, I, that's when I'm shy and I don't have lines and I don't have a specific role. So I make sure that for in my head, the gig doesn't end until I get to my hotel room. And that's when the gig is over. Yeah. I mean, I think that's, if I were in your position and I'm totally projecting here, so forgive my projection, but I would feel like the weight of the conversations that I would have to have with people off stage would be so much so much heavier and so much more taxing because they do feel super important. Like, you know, most of the time when we get off stage with the conversations that we're having are like, Hey, I really like this new song or like the really nerdy kids who are like, Hey, what synthesizers are you using? You know, or like, how did you do this sound on the record or like that sort of a stuff, which is easy. You're like tackling really complex issues that people find very polarizing. And a lot of times, whether they want to or not, I feel, and I feel like I witnessed this firsthand whenever you and I were at Wild Goose together, those conversations can just seem really intense, almost like in a threatening way way because you've challenged a lot of people's ideas about climate change or sexuality. They have all these other tapes that they're playing in their mind, these old tapes, and you have no idea what they're saying. You know what I mean? Right. What the tapes are telling them and like and how that's really charging. Meant for. Exactly. Yeah. So I don't know if you have like specific ways of kind of distancing yourself from that sort of a thing or just engaging. Yeah. I mean, I think 
the challenge is when you're when you are shy, it, it could seem like you're aloof or you're mm. rude, or like or arrogant. Right. When really, it's like incredibly self protective. Uh, mm. And after I do a show, I feel so vulnerable because I shared a lot of myself in the show yeah. typically, and I pushed myself to be as open as humanly possible. Yeah. And I, I think the hardest, I mean, I could handle if someone has like, wants to challenge me on a point or they have a contrary view, that's easier in some ways. It's the hard part is I was vulnerable. Therefore I opened up my heart and it encourages other people to be vulnerable. And then they may come to me with something incredibly personal mm. and incredibly traumatic that I feel really empathetic about, but I feel completely unprepared to do anything to help with. I mean, I'm not a therapist. And so I've created this space where people feel open and they can trust me. Uh, and I'm so happy for that. But on the other hand, I'm like, I am not able to do anything other than just listen, which maybe is what a lot of people just need and just say, yeah, I hear that. That's really horrible. And I hope you're talking to somebody professional about it because it's serious stuff. Yeah, I I've I definitely had that experience before with people coming up to us after shows and kind of I don't even want to call it oversharing. I feel like mm -hmm. whatever happened, like they they heard a song. It meant something to them. It might not have been anything in my mind when I was writing the song. But for some reason, they see this as like an open door to want to talk about something immensely personal. And like when we started doing all of these comeback shows, I was having some of those conversations like at the merch table with people and the next day, I remember like talking to my wife, Jessica, and I was like, I I have all of this weird nervous energy in me because I, I don't know because I feel like they were giving me something really personal and maybe I wasn't giving them something personal back, but I couldn't like it's not it's not the place. It's not the time. It's not the anything like the only thing you can really do is just say, I'm I'm so sorry. That must be, you know, tell tell me more about that. Like, what does that mean for you now? So I've like. I've learned some different tricks of the trade, I guess, to to kind of help move the conversation along. But you still kind of it is this weird, this weird social place to be in when people are being so vulnerable with you. Yeah. Yeah. And you're not really sure what to do with it. To, to me, it's a compliment, though, of us as artists. Right. Because it means that we spoke from our heart mm. and we we were able to reach somebody's heart and that that, you know, that's a special thing. And that's, I think, what makes art so amazing is that mm -hmm. it has these other connections. It's not just what you're saying. People pick up on other things. And that's why I love using your music in Bubble and Squeak, because some may say, oh, it's it's light pop music. I'm like, no, I hear a lot of other <laughs> threads coming through there that really echo some of the wacky and serious topics that come up in bubble and squeak and compliments it beautifully man that is that's such a kind thing for you to say i i always wonder what people are getting because i know that we're a mixed bag and i feel like we were always kind of hearing from from other people or from record labels that it's like hey you're you have an identity crisis like you don't know what you are <laughs> Um, and you would need to figure that out. And I feel like our, our retort to that is like, we're all of it. Yeah. We are super, super goofy and fun and want to make jokes and just laugh and have a play on words kind of a moment and like just experience the joy of you know, something as frivolous as pop music. And then there are other times where it just like, it comes to a grinding halt and it's like, no, we have something really fucking serious to talk about. Or I went yeah. through this thing and I really want to like tell you what that looked like for me. But yeah, anyway, it's just, it, it's encouraging to hear somebody pick up on that and lean into no, it. That's why it works so beautifully with, you know, because what I'll do is I'll have a segment of my show and then it goes, I have an interlude and the music is the interlude and it complements it so beautifully uh, and, and, and especially as, you know, there's, there's that, I don't know, there's like often this thread in the center of it that is not so obvious, but it adds a depth and a weight to it. And it, it reveals that, yeah, you know, we can genuinely believe life is great, but if life is hard and we live in really <laughs> weird times where social media makes our lives very complicated. Mm. Um, feeling good about ourselves gets challenged every time we turn on the stupid internet machine and <laughs> you know it's just 
yeah. it's really rough. And and you know, and I think of younger people who listen to the, your music. They are growing up in such a bizarro time mm. uh, with climate change, with these vast changes in the world, uh, shifts politically. Yeah, and uh, yeah, yeah. You're gonna have fun. You're gonna figure out who you are. But people worry about stuff. And and if you're gonna be a whole person, that's gonna come out in your work. Yeah, I I completely agree with that. And one of the reasons that I wanted to have you on the show was sort of to introduce our listeners to, because I'm a big fan of Bubble and Squeak. I'm a big fan of you and what you do. And and I was just introduced to what you were doing like last year at Wild Goose. And so um, if if nothing else, it was completely worth the <laughs> worth, uh, trudging through the mud <laughs> to get to your performance. Um, but yeah, we were, we were goosed for sure. Yeah. So like take, take, take everybody listening to Eleven D Life on a bit of a journey through what the idea behind Bubble and Squeak is. Sure. Uh, well, Bubble and Squeak is a British dish, actually, that people cook. Uh, and a bubble and squeak is a fry and, and it often is served at breakfast. There might be eggs in it, but it's, it's literally whatever you have in the fridge. So if you've got some onions and cabbage and sausage, you throw it all in a fry pan and you fry it up and you serve it. And that's like what the show is. Basically, it's all these different pieces that I've been collecting in my head or on audio. And they yeah. may seem like they have nothing to do with each other, but we're just going to throw it all together in one show and see what happens. <laughs> and so that's where the title came from. And the show, I do another show called Citizens Climate Radio, which is a very conventional podcast magazine format where I interview people and have artists on as well. It's it's a kind of NPR style and it's yeah. got a very professional tone to it. And I love it. I have so much fun with it, but I can't be fully free artistically on it because I'm doing it for an organization and they've got, uh, you know, a whole style. That is, you know, is, is doesn't encompass everything that I do. So I wanted yeah. to have a playground, an audio playground where I could experiment with sounds, with with characters. I'm a character actor, so I'll play all these wacky characters and see what happens. The show has three parts always and sort of fact, fiction and sound. So the first part is some sort of nonfiction. It might be, might be me telling a personal story of some weird thing that happened to me. Yeah. The most recent one is when I served former Secretary of State Henry Kissinger lunch and he wanted nothing that I served him. He kept sending me back to the kitchen. And here I am like, you know, just turned 20 and very insecure and having to deal with this bully. <laughs> felt yeah. like a bully. But then there was a bully <laughs> in the kitchen who was like upset that I kept coming back and trying to navigate it all. And uh, so there's like a story like that. And then I'll do some, you know, or I'll, let me interview someone. Like I interview people like Elizabeth Rush, who wrote a great book about sea level rise. But it, in the interview, she revealed that when she went to these coastal communities as a woman, she was sexually harassed at every turn mm. and not by people in the community, but by people who were supposed to be her colleagues and partners. And that mm. was something that I, it didn't fit with the Citizens Climate Radio and the segment we did. But I was like, I want people to hear that. Yeah. That's important truth. Yeah. So the first part is truth. It's fact. It's storytelling, but being as honest as possible. The second part is the fiction, and that's a lot of uh, radio play, radio drama, and that's where I will have a segment just in character, yeah. or I will. I've been pr playing around with um, prank phone calls uh, and making fictional and real prank phone calls and seeing what happens. Yeah. And so the first one was um, a prank phone call to the past, where I um, call a, you know, I pretend <laughs> I'm calling a grocery store in during World War II and I asked for <laughs> tofu and kombucha and see what oh my happens. God. And it's just silly, right? But I play all the voices, which people don't realize that like all the voices are my voices there. Uh, and, and that's a lot of fun. So there's a lot of these weird segments or I'll have different characters that I do. And the last part is the audio part. So like when I travel... You know, a lot of people, when they travel, they take lots of photos and I do as well, but I also take a lot of audio. Mm -hmm. I will just take out an audio recorder and say, huh, here I am in Havana, Cuba. It sounds really interesting. Yeah. Let me just record two minutes of audio. And I have a collection, like people have a collection of photos. I have a collection of audio from different places in the world. So the last section who, which a lot of people really like, it's very relaxing. They find, Yeah. I just say, 
let me set the scene for you. And I explain where I am and what I'm doing. And the audio gets louder and louder. And then I just leave you with the audio for 30 to 60 seconds, Mm -hmm. enjoying that audio. I, I find this fascinating. One of the questions I wanted to ask you was when you're doing these prank phone calls in particular, like to the past, or, I mean, I guess I guess being familiar with your show and having heard a lot of different segments, I always wonder if there is a, if you consider there to be a therapeutic quality in sort of diving into these characters is there is there some sort of like empathy string kind of running through it is it a mental exercise for you does it help you to formulate your thoughts more clearly to be embodying other characters or yeah just what does that look like that's a great question okay so for instance in the episode um entitled hairless gerbils Okay. <laughs> uh, where Elizabeth Rush appears. The second segment, I play a character named Elizabeth Jeremiah from the Elizabeth Jeremiah Global Worldwide Ministries <laughs> in Jesus. Right. <laughs> and she is very upset because she had the opportunity to to stop Donald Trump in his tracks back in the 80s when she was Mm. in New York City and she bumped into him when he was just an up and coming guy. Yeah. And she could have stopped him because she has a special ministry and that is the discerning of evil spirits (laughs) and casting out of evil spirits. Now, as, as a gay guy who is a Christian who went through a lot of evangelical and Pentecostal churches, I've had my run-ins with people trying to cast out evil spirits. So already I'm there playing with this notion, but then putting it within our contemporary context of a president that, you know, some people find very disturbing and and scary. Uh, And so in the piece, she then has to discern what evil spirits he has. And she, you know, (laughs) I can't remember the line, but it's something like, yeah, I can just look into a loved one's eyes and see what demonic powers are operating in their soul. It gets very inconvenient at times. (laughs) So she looks in Donald Trump's soul and finds what people would imagine, like the spirit of lust, the spirit of pride, lasciviousness. But then she reveals that um, the ruling spirit, which you have to kind of get out, because there's one spirit that rules them all, Black and Tolkien. (laughs) That one spirit that rules them all is the spirit of insecurity. Oh, and wow. And she said, now the spirit of insecurity, now that's a hard one. I mean, it takes prayer and fasting and colonics. I mean, and I didn't have that kind of time. <laughs> colonics. <laughs> and, so, and so in a way, here's this person that like pe- some many people, some not everyone, but many people revile Donald Trump. But suddenly they're like, wait, his ruling spirit is the spirit of insecurity? Like, that's my ruling spirit. That's like all of our ruling spirits in so many ways. Yeah. Mm. And it does humanize that situation. Situation. And so, yeah, I think that it's definitely not therapy, but it is therapeutic. I can see that because I'm working through my own past and revisiting it. Like some of these stories I tell mm. was when I was desperately trying not to be gay, trying to be the perfect little Christian, which meant being heterosexual and masculine yeah. and, um, and doing ridiculous things and submitting myself to ridiculous things to make that happen and dangerous. Yeah. So while it's silly and it definitely is and it's totally loads of fun it it's woven in like your music right it it's got these other themes going through that it's pulling and tugging on man i absolutely love that and i totally connect with these like old south kind of uh, protestant characters I, I feel like that was what was on our television that was what was on our cassette tapes that was like everything my earliest musical memories are southern gospel and Like even even our friends that we would go over to their house, it was like their parents would have a totally different set of Gaither VHSs, you know, for (laughs) for us to explore. That's insider baseball for people that didn't grow up uh, in a Christian home. (laughs) But um, (laughs) yeah, it's it's kind of crazy. I always I always loved those kinds of characters that were that always kind of had this air about them. That's like, I have the spiritual gift and I'll take one for the team. Cause y'all yeah. have no idea what kind of burden this is on me. That's right. Um, I, yeah. So, <laughs> and, and there's the added thing, like with this Elizabeth Jeremiah, she's also in a church structure where she's not technically allowed to minister as a woman. So she has to have this side hustle of being this person who's casting out demons. Cause she can't be the senior pastor. 
So what I see when I was in, living in the South myself and I saw in these churches, these women who were so able and capable, but, yeah. but there was no space for them. They had to then have a satellite ministry. That See, that's, that's so weird. I always want to like go to people and say, you know, what's the worst thing that could happen to put a confident and competent woman <laughs> who has all of her shit together um, in a leadership role with people that really need guidance. Right. Like, what is the worst thing that could happen if you did that? And, and yeah. I feel like it's always kind of met with this, uh, this, you know, well, Bible says, uh, yeah. Okay. I witnessed this amazing exchange once between the writer, Kurt Vonnegut and the writer, Joyce Carol Oates. Mm. And Kurt Vonnegut was talking about all the horrible things that we've done, like to the planet and to the economy. And Joyce Carol Oates jumps in and she says, you mean what men have done? And he's like, what, what are you talking about? <laughs> well, uh, technically men did those things because they ran the countries and the companies that did most of that. It's likely that women may have done the same things, but we really don't know because we haven't had the opportunity. Right. So I think it's more accurate to say it's stuff that men did. <laughs> wow. Man, I love that. I love pot stirrers. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> One of the things that I wanted to talk to you about, and we touched on this very, very briefly whenever we got to spend a little bit of time together earlier this year, but one of the things I found so fascinating about what you do live in sort of creating these narratives and exploring these really complex subjects through the eyes of other characters is that there's some things that I would love to be able to say to people in my life that I am not the best mouthpiece for. Right. Like there are things I want to say to my parents or my family or close friends, things that just places where I've landed in my own spiritual life or on different issues, you know, culturally, that I, I would love to be able to present this side of, of an argument or this facet of belief about these topics. Um, I know that sounds broad, but I, coming from me, I have too much history with my parents or my family for them to hear what I'm saying now because. They're also hearing old Matt. They're hearing all the old tapes. They have this whole history of media, you know what I mean, logged away in their brain that's constantly filtering, uh, that, or that they're constantly filtering me, Matt, now through. And I feel like that happens for a lot of people in, in any family, like in any, any family dynamic that happens. But when I saw you embody these other characters, I thought this is one of the most amazing things that I've seen because you're changing the mouthpiece of yourself. Like you're embodying a different person, people that would look at you and immediately write you off because it's like, oh, he's he's trying to tell me about climate change and he's gay and oh my God, he's got an agenda and all these different things. You know what I mean? That people, especially in the South, would would assume about you. You almost like use your artistry as a way of taking them out of that and giving them a character that they can hear this information from in a right. different way. And I just thought that was so beautiful the way that you were able to craft that. I'm not, I'm not trying to back pat you until you're raw back there, but um, I don't mind. Yeah. <laughs> I don't mind at all. Just pat away. <laughs> but I didn't know if that was something that you, that you're also very aware of, or if you feel like that is just a byproduct of you sort of figuring out the best ways to express your, your passions and your thoughts. The character work came about um, for three different reasons. I think one, when I first started, appearing on stage, I was so shy, but I had something important to say. And it was about the the harm of conversion therapy, because I spent almost 20 years mm. getting conversion therapy. Oh my God. Standing up and just talking about it was just ugh, depressing and difficult. Yeah. But I found when I created a play about it called Doing Time in the Homo Nomo Halfway House, right. <laughs> when I added the element of comedy, but then also put it in other people's mouths. Like I created nine different characters that I yeah. played. It gave me enough of a distance from it that mm. I somehow was able to be more emotionally honest. And I was able to get closer to the topic wow. by doing that. So for me, it helped me to, to have a better presentation. It also helps if you do a 60 or 90 minute presentation, people get tired of one person. Mm. So mixing it up, it just sort of 
it, it helps with just structurally the flow so people don't get bored because it gets all these different characters. Um, but finally, it's what you say too, there's certain information people won't take from certain people. Mm. So when I, in, in the show that you saw, everything is connected an evening of stories, most weird, many true. I, at one point I look, look at the story of Joseph in the book of Genesis mm. and I'm presenting some information that people may be very resistant to that Joseph was gender nonconforming mm. and that the coat of many colors actually is one interpretation is it was a princess dress. Right. If you just say that out, people are very defensive, but instead I tell the story of Joseph through the perspective of his uncle Esau, this mm-hmm. big, burly, manly man who is completely intolerant of his girly boy nephew. Yeah. And that gives it so much more power because people, some people trust that guy more than they trust me. Yeah. Or they relate to that guy. Yes. Or that guy is their uncle who had been awful to them. Mm-hmm. And then at the end of that monologue, he concedes that like, well, this girly boy, he saved us all. And it's this twist right at the end that people don't expect that he acknowledges how important Joseph was, even though he was so different. Yeah. And, and, and I like that. And then in the next scene, when I have the character talking about climate change, I bring up the Joseph story again. And that character gets to talk about me in a critical way. Cause says, yeah, I got my friend, this friend Peterson, he, you know, he tells this Joseph story. He says, it's, you know, it, it's really a princess dress. I don't even know if that's true. It doesn't matter. <laughs> this story is actually about climate change. <laughs> and so the character has a different authority because critiquing the guy who came before of in this New York way. And yeah, so I think strategically it works in lots of ways and it, and it opens people up. And whenever I've performed in middle schools and high schools, God, thank God I've got characters because all those like boys who are just so like resistant, as soon as I st- start doing funny voices, they're like, oh my gosh, he does amazing voices. I do voices too. Let's do voices. <laughs> well, they don't really so have a choice. Voices. Their puberty is making that a reality for them one way or the other. <laughs> I, I I absolutely love that. What do you think so far has been the most, because I know that you do a bunch of different, you know, how, how many, and you've been doing this for years. So I have to imagine that you have kind of done, you've scripted a lot of these different acts. And I wonder if there's one that stands out to you as being pulled from a really important place and it not not to say that all of them aren't but i mean if there's like a specific one that you're like this was a hard one to write this is one that i wrestled Hmm. with uh in my play transfigurations transgressing gender in the bible where i look at various gender non-conforming bible characters including the ethiopian eunuch Mm -hmm. in acts chapter eight i um i was surprised at how emotional i got when i worked on the scene about the ethiopian eunuch Mm. because I'm not from Ethiopia. You know, I'm not African. Yeah. I'm not a eunuch. I mean, I'm gay, but it's not the same as a eunuch. <laughs> right. But as I'm looking at this story and I did the research about the sort of physical suffering that eunuchs go through, yeah, uh, including the inability to have their own children. Mm. And, and so they're often, chi- they're often childless unless they adopt. And here's this eunuch who had just been to the temple where there was a place, there's a place for foreigners in the temple. Um, although it may have been complicated, like is this a male or a female, it's a eunuch, high voice, no beard. But the hardest thing probably was it was a place filled with families Mm. and children. And that just wasn't in the cards for him. Mm. And, you know, and, and, and he's reading about someone who's suffering, you know, who, who like a sheep before the shears is silent, like a lamb before the slaughter, he too opened not his mouth in his humiliation. Justice was denied him. Who can speak of his offspring mm. for his life was cut off. And in Christian churches, they often say, oh, that's Isaiah's prophecy about Jesus suffering and dying for our sins, which is one interpretation. Sure. But if you're a eunuch reading it, suddenly you're like, wait, is this a story about a eunuch? Because this sounds like my story. Yeah. And the part where, you know, like not having descendants, being a man without children, and it just didn't work for me, you know, because I'm gay and, you know, not that gay people can't have children, but it is fairly difficult and complicated. It's the new (laughs) don't ask, don't tell. Right. You don't ask and don't tell where you got those kids from. Just just move on. (laughs) (laughs) But I was surprised at how much pain I had for not having children. And it's not realistic that I will at this age of my life either. 
And that surprised me. It was a place I didn't expect to go to. Um, and it made the scene particularly poignant to perform. And often I would cry. And those were my tears, uh, not the character's tears. And mm. uh, it was it was really, I, it was unexpected. Yeah. So, you know, I think we live in a time where people can question these traditional structures. And in part because I think sometimes it's like the normal route. You start it and every step you're given a script. Mm. Like, okay, now you're dating and this is what that looks like. Ah, now you're engaged. So this is what that looks like. Oh, now you're married. Right. Hi, honey. I'm home. Do you have a great day? I'm like, there's these weird scripts. And not that they're bad things. And, you know, but I think sometimes people don't have the opportunity to question, is that what I really want? Um, because it's put out there as like, of course, this is the approved path, the best one. Uh, and I think as a, as a gay person, we automatically have to question these scripts. I mean, even like with my husband, you know, we don't have traditional gender roles to fall back on. So who right. cooks, who does the dishes, you know, like we have to decide that based on ability, like who does it. But, and I think a lot of straight couples do as well, but they still have to fight those traditional roles. Like if the husband wants to stay home and take care of the kids, it's, it's still weird in our society, mm. uh, in a way that it, it shouldn't be because men should be able to take care of the kids just as well as women. And some fathers can do it better than the mothers. And you get all this information that somehow playing that role is emasculating to you or that you somehow yeah. have not fulfilled your, your purpose or your religious destiny <laughs> by being a stay at home dad. <clears throat> yeah. And it does actually, um, yeah, like even they question like, you know, are you out of God's will and, and changing the hierarchy that God has where it's like husbands over the wives and, you know, wives over the children and all this sort of thing. And that's what I was told a lot for being gay that, you know, part of the problem was that, you know, God has a very specific order of things. And when mm. you look at that order, it's like, well, it's not great for women, that order typically. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. Yeah. So I don't know how I'm going to do in this, in this next segment, um, <laughs> in terms of, I don't know if I have the ability yet to be as articulate as I would like to be, but I, I feel like a lot of people assume things about me based off of the work that like earlier work that I've done and the fact that like our band was on a Christian record label and we were in all these different publications. And, um, I don't consider myself to be a Christian. I don't subscribe to that. I do find I feel like the the more distance that I get from my upbringing in the church and my experience in Southern Protestant America, which is a very specific subsect of all of that, um, <clears throat> the more I I'm learning to appreciate the story and the narrative of Christ alongside a lot of other spiritual narratives that have happened on the planet. And I feel like it's taking there there is that the narrative of Christ is is constantly sort of reforming in my mind. I'm reforming my thoughts about it. It's becoming bigger and wider and more beautiful in some ways and more subversive in other ways and very vulgar in others. But I feel like for me I had to just say, you know what, I whatever this is, I am what I am, whether or not I call myself a thing or not. Hmm. I'm on my journey whether or not I'm calling it Christianity or, you know what I mean? It just, it feels like this weird thing where we assume this sort of spiritual power uh, and this to be a spiritual truth that if we call ourselves Christian, that's the most important thing that at the end of all things, when we end up in this, uh, you know, narrative that may or may not be true, you know, that we're standing before God and we somehow get judged, which doesn't make any sense. Doesn't make, never made any sense to me that like Christ came and said that there's no, that there's not, that sin doesn't matter. You know what I mean? That it's paid for, that you don't have to worry about this, but then somehow you also get judged at the end and you kind of, an assessment of your life is taken. This is what it was explained to me as a child. Right. <laughs> um, I've found it healthiest for me to just abandon it and say, mm. I'm, I just am what I am and I believe what I believe. And I'm not choosing to not believe something out of a malicious you know, intent. I'm not trying to tear somebody else's beliefs down. I'm not trying to deconstruct everything that I have issues with for other people. I'm just saying <clears throat> when I'm by myself and I'm alone with my thoughts, I only have my set of experiences in this life. And I only have my thoughts and I ultimately land in different places and that place changes over time. The way I viewed the world at 12 wasn't the same it was at 15 or 20 or 25 or 30. It's a constantly evolving thing. 
So I think I've just done away with all of those labels. And I wonder, because I, I'm such a huge fan of, of what you do. And a lot of what you do is diving into these biblical narratives. And it sounds very much like you, you, you do identify as a Christian. And I just, I'm interested to know what that looks like for you, what that means for you and why, especially being um, a gay man and living amongst all of these different, you know, where, where the primary Christian voice on the planet is constantly coming down on you. You know what I mean? Um, why are you still there? Well, there's a question I want you to think about as I'm answering your question, and that is, what do you miss? from your time when you were going to church regularly? Like, is there something that you, you miss from that time, uh, that you, you know, you haven't been able to find because it just doesn't exist in the world that you have now. Sure, And it's, so that's just one thing to think about, you know, for me, I tried actually to be an atheist for a short time. Mm. I aspired to be an atheist. Sure. I was terrible at it. I kept (laughs) praying and thinking about God and stuff like that. I was Mm -hmm. a naughty atheist. (laughs) (laughs) And I, you know, I just, I I understood that my life would be in some ways far less complicated if I simply did not believe or did not have faith uh, that life would be simpler, especially Mm -hmm. as a gay man. Yeah. Uh, but, you know, uh, and, and coming out like you did just now as someone who's not a Christian, that is a coming out experience in America. Um, because, again, it's one of the things that's often valued and rewarded when you're a person of faith. Uh, and my mom wasn't a person of faith, but she in some ways wanted to be. She she just simply could not. The way she saw the world could not believe. And yeah. she admired people who could because she felt that it's a helpful thing to have, mm. to have this belief that someone's there you can turn to when you're all alone. Yeah. That's, a, that's an incredible thing. And she just she just said she couldn't do it. She was very honest about that. Mm-hmm. Uh, in my case, it's it's kind of the opposite. I, you know, I, I, I. I'm wired for God. I'm wired for spirituality in a way that is so inherently part of me. Mm. And even if I weren't a Christian, I would have to be a something because having faith and spirituality is just key to who I am. Mm. Uh, And being gay made it complicated because I was told you can't be gay and Christian. And so I was for years trying to lop off that gay part. And then when I became, Accepted, I was gay. I thought, oh, I guess I have to lop off the Christian part. Uh, The harder part has been, of course, integrating the two in a way that Mm. feels right for me. Ultimately, I stopped going to traditional churches and began attending Quaker meetings, which are constructed very differently in, in most Quaker meetings that I've been to, they don't have pastors and there's no singing, there's no prayers. It's just sitting in silence until someone feels they have something worthwhile to say. And that has been a really important experience, worship experience for me, because I don't need to hear another sermon. Lord knows I have heard hundreds, hundreds of sermons. Mm -hmm. I do not need to hear another sermon, but I do need to sit and reflect. I think that's really a helpful thing for me. Yeah. And so, you know, I don't like talk a lot about how I'm a Christian. Um, I talk about I'm a Bible scholar. I talk about, you know, I'm an activist and these to me are kind of outgrowths of my spirituality, but I speak to a lot of people who are not religious and I don't want them to feel that I'm pushing on them a religion, even as I'm talking about the Bible. And that's what I think Mm. is interesting about the Bible work I get to do is I'm looking at the people in these stories. And that's why I think the Bible is so enduring. Like, Shakespeare, it has stories. It has peoples that we can, people we can really relate to, mm. uh, who we could relate with their weaknesses, the silly things that they do, the struggles that they're in. And as stories, they're really, really powerful. Yeah. And I find that, you know, if I don't focus on doctrine, like, well, what does it all mean? And focus more <laughs> on like, who are these people? And I think that's where it helps that I'm an actor. I'm a trained actor. So I look at a Bible text, like I would look at a script mm. and I was like, okay, well, yeah. there's all sorts of backstory. We don't know things that are being unsaid, things that are being said with one's body tone, all this stuff, trying to look at them as a human subject, as opposed to a biblical subject. 
And that I think that has helped a lot with my work to make it accessible to lots of people, mm. including loads of people who are not Christians or believers. Man, I, I resonate so much more with that approach of like, I'm, I'm really not interested in, in what your hangups are and what your theology is and what, you know, whether like what hills you're going to die on. I just <laughs> am more interested in being here right now. Because you've had a totally different set of experiences on this planet that I haven't had. And I want to be practicing humility in that I have no idea what it's like to be you. You know what I mean? And I feel like I'm far more interested in us having those conversations than I am in saying, hey, you know this Bible? Let's debate it. You know what I mean? Like, let's talk about. Like, right. Yeah, I just feel like it really another wall, like yeah. another hurdle to jump over. Like, I feel like we're running out of time. That sounds mm -hmm. sensationalist to say, but I, I always have this like ticking clock in the back of my head. It's like, you, you're not going to be here much longer. Mm. Like in the big scheme of things. Yeah. Why, why at the end of all mm -hmm. things, do you want to be able to, to maybe stand before a God that may or may not exist and say, I ticked all your boxes. Mm. That's why I love hospital chaplains mm. no matter if they're southern baptist or methodist or whatever they are dealing with people often end of life trauma whatever and it's like they've got the big picture in mind here yeah. here's someone who is scared here's someone who is suffering mm. does it really matter at this moment if they believe exactly the way i do yeah my job is to provide comfort and care and I, you know, I guess if someone very, very strongly believes that unless you accept Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior, you're going to have an eternity where God will make sure that you're being tortured, which makes God an incredibly cruel person, crueler than any tyrant that lives on the planet today. Right. If that's what you believe, I can see why you feel like you need to lead that person to Christ. But most chaplains recognize that their job is to provide comfort, is to provide love and support and, you know, the, the important things. And they get to see it in that perspective in right. ways that a local pastor doesn't always see it. We, we call that um, the bear trap in the cookie jar. Like no parent would ever <laughs> put a bear trap in a cookie jar because that, I mean, just the offense of stealing a cookie when no one's looking is so benign. And the more that you zoom out of the human experience, all of these mistakes that we make, the things that actually give us our, our color and our texture as people and, and, um, and help us to express and experience uh, empathy and connection with each other are all these messy bits. They're all hands in the cookie jar kind of experiences. Yeah. So yeah. why would there be a bear trap in there? <laughs> Some years ago, I was interviewed by the BBC when I was in, I, I tour a lot in the UK and, uh, you know, it's just kind of going through about like, I'm gay and I'm a Christian, blah, blah, blah. And then the last question, I'm not sure where it came from, if someone gave it to the person or it was their own, but they were like, so one question, final question I have for you. <laughs> what if when you get to heaven, when you die, you, you discover that you were wrong? And um, and that you actually um, are out of God's favor and you are sent to hell. What then? And, you know, that was his little gotcha moment. Of course. And I thought, well, after the incredibly serious, thoughtful journey I've been on to try to figure out how to live my life right. morally, ethically, how to, you know, asking God genuine questions, if after all that time, you know, God is this tyrant that sends me to hell, then that's not the God I want to serve. That is a horrible being that is not worthy of my affection and devotion because they're so unreasonable and so thoughtless uh, that they they didn't see how serious I was to get it right and to seek that person. I was like, I would have to be an outward rebellion to that person. Which is not what he expected to hear, but like mm. the God that he presented was such an unreasonable, cruel God. Uh, and that is, I think, one of the challenges that Christians struggle with today in the USA is they often present this loving God who's also a sociopath. Mm. And it's like, which one is it? I, I don't I don't yeah. get it because this is if this person were your neighbor, you'd have to get an order of protection against them because right. they would be just so like insane. Or, or at the very least, bipolar. Um, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah.
Man, I, yeah, that's a very, very thoughtful response. Go, so going to your question that I've been thinking about, mm. um, my experience is the, the music, right? You missed. The oh Christian my God. Music. It's just yeah, fire, fire that worship. organ up and get Tara Sing down that, there. Yeah, that's right. The hymns or the chorus that just never ends. That's what you must miss as a musician. It's so weird. Cause I've gone through, <laughs> I've gone through so many phases. Like there was, there was this phase in my, um, in my my faith journey or religious journey through Christianity that we were constantly being told to exploit our faith for profit. And, right. and well, tell us, but tell, you know, what, what's so wrong about if Jesus is the most important thing to you, then put him in a song and tell everybody about this experience that you're having and like, help us paint this narrative that life is better with him. And I just thought, but that's not true. I have more questions than answers. And if Christ and this whole idea of Christianity is so sacred and it's so important, why would I give it to you to make money off of? <laughs> to these, like, just perpetuating this narrative. Right. It just didn't quite make any sense to me. My experience in church has been very complicated because I have, because it gave me all of these weird pathways in my mind mm. that that as an adult have turned into real problems that I have to go to therapy for now. And so I still feel like I have these religious flashbacks of these like fire and brimstone teachings from the pulpit and just being a terror. I was a really melancholy kid because I mm. thought about hell so much. I thought I never thought there was anything that I could do to win favor with God. It, like, it didn't matter what I do. It was like, it was just, you were put into this game that you couldn't win somehow. Right. And when you're a kid so, and you have like no context for any of that, it's it's terrifying. Yeah. So in answering my question, though, so what is it that you've identified that is if is, is anything that you miss from those those years, those times that that you haven't been able to recapture in your new life? Well, this is part. This is part of me kind of taking that inventory and and uh, and running through those those memories and those thoughts and, and seeing if there is anything that I, that I actually do miss, you know, the things that I loved, like my favorite memories of church were, um, the civic aspects of it. Uh, mm -hmm. the, the community, the being able to be around other people that played instruments, playing on the worship team, be, being able to jam punk rock tunes in between, uh, in between songs <laughs> with my friends, you know, like all of that stuff was really fun. Meeting, meeting people, meeting girls, learning, how to socialize, having a place where you you spoke the lingo and you fit in, um, mm -hmm. and that you had a, a defined place. I think that those are things that I that I enjoyed at the time, and I feel like my, just my understanding of it all now as an adult. I don't, as an adult, miss that. Like mm. I have a community of musicians and friends and even people like you, Peterson, that I can get on Skype with and I can talk about, I can be vulnerable about my, my thoughts and ideas about religion and spirituality and what it means to seek um, and, and where I am now in that journey. And I find that being that for other people, being that inclusive, like, look, you don't have to land anywhere. Let's just be here right now. Let's just do the yeah. deathbed thing. Let's what's hurting you right now. Where, yeah. what, what's happening with you? Um, I have found that to be a source of so much more joy and so a, su such a broader spectrum of life uh, experience. It's almost like taking something from grayscale to just complete you know, Roy G. Biv. <laughs> it just, there's, I feel like there's so much more there and that's something that has happened with or without the confines of having to have a religiously based conversation mm -hmm. with people. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I think that's, what's important for people to recognize who are struggling right now. Should I leave my church? Should I stay? Mm. Uh, because it, seems like the the epicenter of the world particularly if you're a teenager or a young adult sure uh, uh and and the reality is i i heard a study that came out of evangelical churches that said that the vast majority of youth pastors mm. ultimately end up leaving the church yeah uh and so even the youth pastors uh end up leaving and and, and more people leave than stay so it's actually not terribly uncommon for someone to leave but it, it, when you do leave, I think there's often this sense of like, oh, I'll never be able to recreate this. 
uh, this this space, these people, uh, and and it's hard. I mean, it's always harder once you go out, get out of college to recreate those spaces because you're just people are working, doing their thing, but um, it can be done totally. And and it is, I think, about what you're talking about being real and being mm-hmm. vulnerable. And I think that's what I think so many people appreciate about those those days in those churches that they had this sense that they were able to be be real. The reality is I think we always had to censor ourselves too, because if you were too real, you might uh, be suspect. (laughs) There's no way I'm telling you what this unspoken means, Peterson. (laughs) My unspoken prayer request. Oh my God. Right. But yeah, no, it's, it's, I think that's, I I love what we're doing here at rock candy. I love the, uh, the shows that are coming up. Um, I love that <laughs> I could use your music now. I don't know if you've listened to the most recent episode of Bubble and Squeak. Um, the title is um, Masturbate Theater. <laughs> I don't know how I've missed that, but I, I'm right, yeah. making a note that that has to be my next thing I pull up. Yeah, and so there's a true story I tell the beginning, and it's a story about when I served Henry Kissinger um, lunch and he didn't want it. So I tell that story, <laughs> but then the masturbate theater is I'm projecting like in about 200 years, what will Turner classic movies be showing? Mm. And, um, what if they had like for pride month, the gay porn from the eighties, nineties and naughties. <laughs> and, and they were like doing a whole, like, and talking about these as like classic films yeah. like and, and, you know, just how extraordinary they were. So I went and I went online. The internet is wonderful. This, and I just like, what were the top movies, gay porn movies? And what was the language they used to describe the films? And I just Mm. weave that all into this characters like, and welcome to masturbate theater. (laughs) (laughs) It's it's all very high brow. Of course. And very naughty at the same time. But I love that it ends like with this, like, incredible phrase and your music starts pumping in at the end it's just like it works so beautifully i love how you describe my music as pumping in at the end (laughs) (laughs) oh my god literally (laughs) so yeah so you'll have to check that one out masturbate theater yeah i think the last the last thing that i or the most recent thing that i have heard was actually one of your bible bash episodes about Mm -hmm. JL. Is that how you say her name? Yeah. Or Yael. You can say it either way. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And uh, being naughty with her tent peg. (laughs) I thought that was like much in Sunday school. much. Right. (laughs) Right. (laughs) But yeah, I, I I even, I even loved that, that the, the thing that I love about Bible bash is that so many of these stories I grew up with in the church And being able to reappropriate them or to think about them from a completely different vantage point has in some ways been actually very therapeutic for me because I need interpretations of these things that don't feel as damaging, that don't feel as connected to these really self-deprecating and self-hating ideas that that the church gave me about myself and even just being able to take those kinds of things and turn them on their head and be thinking about them in a different way has, yeah, I would definitely consider it as being in some way therapeutic for me personally. Yeah. Yeah. We haven't talked about Bible bash much, but that's that show I do with uh, Liam Hooper, who is from Winston Salem, North Carolina, Yeah, grew up Southern Baptist. He's now converted to Judaism. Mm. Uh, He's a trans man. Uh, and so he he um, has a whole different perspective on the world. We we joke it's a, a northern bell and a southern gentleman come together <laughs> to talk about text, uh, and and you know and we're not in any way trying to bash the Bible, right? Uh, it's really bashes in the idea of a party. Let's just enjoy ourselves with this and um and and look at these stories in a little deeper way with some different lenses on mm. them and it's been extraordinary just hearing what he has to bring we've had some amazing guests on as well yeah. who shed lights on passages i've like never 
saw in those ways before. I'm working on an episode uh, about Samson and Delilah, which is one of those stories that just gets so flattened out, but it's so complex of what's going on mm, in the story. Yeah. And even like the physical intimacy that they share, which is non-procreative, right? They're having sexual relations in this story and yeah. there's some bondage involved. There's all kinds of interesting things. Yeah. And their intimacy deepens to the point where he's willing to reveal his secret. Yeah. And and these get these stories get flattened down. It's like, oh well, it's because he succumbed to sexual desire. But if you look at his previous wife, who previous sexual partner who was also from the Philistines, if she didn't give up the dirt on him, they were they they destroyed her family. Mm. They like and so this woman is trapped. Delilah's trapped between a rock and a hard place. Yeah. And Samson ultimately sacrifices himself and gives her the secret uh that releases her from the oppression of her people mm. demanding an answer from all the surveillance that they're doing. And I mean it's a it's a very moving story. I'm just so like struck by that. And and again it's about looking at the people and the conditions. And I I think for those of us who have been these stories have been used as moral lessons like you're t- you're too naughty. Be wary of women. Thoughts. <laughs> Look out. Right. I was not wary of women at all. So it wasn't a problem for me. Of course, <laughs> he didn't know how to deal with me. <laughs> My first girlfriends, they were like, you're the perfect gentleman. I'm like, yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, but yeah. And, and like these, these stories were just basically used to, to, for behavior modification and right, to control right. our desires and to scare the snot out of us. So we would behave. Right. Um, and, and as a result, we lose the, the <clears throat> depth, the complexity of these stories that has so much more to say. Yeah, man. I love that. Um, you're doing the Lord's work, Peterson. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I, this is, this is so wonderful. I, I actually, I wish that you, where are you right now? I'm home in Pennsylvania, rural central Pennsylvania. Amish buggies are going by even as we speak. Oh my gosh. That that's I, I had this um one of my one of my role models when I was a teenager, I was super into this this guy named Rich Mullins. I don't know if you remember him. Oh, yeah, he was great. He was one of the, he was like I think one of the more thoughtful and really skilled contemporary Christian yeah. musicians. So the the weird thing was like I was not a fan of his music at all. Um because mm. I thought I thought it was like kind of boring and um, it just wasn't like, I was obviously a teenager at the time. So I'm looking for something a little more, you know, to help me express my angst and, uh, malcontent with the world around me. Um, but I always, I, I would find these clips of him on the internet, um, talking about things, or I would just kind of pour over the liner notes, um, his thoughts about the songs that he was singing. And I, a couple of my friends, had said that they had seen him at at a few Christian music festivals. And like right before he went on, he had a cigarette in his mouth and he would just kind of stick his cigarette in his acoustic guitar and tune it up and everything and just kind of <laughs> flick the butt away before he walked on stage. And I just thought that was the coolest thing. I mean, when you're a teenager, you think really dumb shit is cool. Um, <laughs> but I just thought, wow, this is somebody who's so confident in what they are say in their own interpretations of of just being authentic about where they are in life that they're at one of the biggest christian music festivals on the planet and they're just being themselves they don't give a shit like he's going to get on stage and say something that means a lot to him and he doesn't care that people are um oh man i just totally fanboyed for a minute and i don't even know where i was going with that <laughs> I was going somewhere with it and I totally forgot. Um, yeah. Anyway, Rich Mullins. Uh, yeah, I saw him live once. He opened for Amy Grant in New York City at Radio City Music Hall. Uh, and I was uh, a college student and I, I didn't know much about contemporary Christian music yeah. at the time, but like she was the one, right? right. She was the big one. Uh, and, uh, and he, but he opened for her by kind of playing her earlier hits because she mm. was just at the cusp of crossing over to the devil side. Which are pretty cringeworthy if, if anybody has the time or the energy to dive into early Amy Grant. I mean, it. Yeah, well, just think about poor Rich Mullins who had to sing through the catalog. <laughs> And that's what I would like that's to hear, what really like killed the him. after show conversations, you know, like when he calls his buddy <laughs> with a cigarette, like, 
Damn it, I had to sing sing your praise to the Lord. I wanted to vomit all over the stage. <laughs> I think Amy Grant had this one song. I, I forget. Um, a, f- a friend of ours who plays this band called Rough and Tumble, her name's Mallory. And she was a huge Amy Grant fan when she was a girl and would like sing uh, sing to Amy Grant backing tracks in church, the whole nine. Yeah, yeah. Um, and she has this the one song karaoke. called Giggle. I don't know if you've heard of this. I don't even know if that's the actual oh, name God. of the song. I think it was on her first album, like her first little popcorn yes. album. Yes. Oh, oh my God. It is the, it is hands down one of the most cringe worthy Christian I mean, I think songs. She was 17 when she produced that song, something like that. And, and it's, it's, it's in a way it's like, so captures like being a teenager, Yes, but here's, she's being put out on this label and it's, yeah. Yeah. I mean, and far be it from me, I am not the guy to be able to stand up on stage and slam Amy Grant for lyrical content because <laughs> I've got my own <laughs> shit to work through. Um, but yeah, I, I always Giggle. thought that was kind of funny. Yeah. So. Well, she's got her father's eyes. Oh, man. Well, do you do that with your friends? Do you like sometimes lead them with a Christian earworm? And you just kind of like leave a message and you're like, our God is an awesome God. Click. <laughs> <laughs> and they're like, oh no, it's never going to leave. I feel like there was like a good five years where we would do that to each other. Or when anybody would do anything nice, we would always, uh, we would always say servant's heart, man. Servant's heart. Because we, we played this church this one time and this guy came up to us and he was just like trying to do all these different things for us to the point that it was kind of awkward, like just following us around, handing us water, um, asking us if we needed towels, like um, just would not let up on it. Like when it was dinner time, I was like, can I make you guys some plates? And it was just like overbearing. Cause we're like, you know, we're actual people that can function like in, in the world. <laughs> and every time that he would do this, he would say, he would say, servant's heart man because we would be like thank you thank you so much for this towel or for this other you know for the 12th bottle of water that you've handed to us um and he's like servant's heart man servant's heart dude dude he was an introvert he found himself a role and it was the servant oh my like, oh. god i'm closer <laughs> to him than i realized maybe function in society by like <laughs> doing things for other people otherwise you'd just be in the corner a little wallflower oh my god i remember when i first started doing gigs at churches before I fully came out, I did a show called Footprints, a a comic expose, and it took the poem Footprints in the Sand, this famous iconic <laughs> poem, and I imagined four very different bizarre characters who believed they had the dream that led to the poem, but the details are all wrong. Right. And, you know, and so it's all very silly, very funny. And I began doing it at churches in the South and Methodist churches and Baptist churches, again, before I came out, although it was very campy sort of show. And I remember it was the first time I heard the phrase, um, a love offering, because they were like, um, you know, I asked, are you able to pay me something? And it's like, well, we're going to, we're going to give you a love offering. And immediately I just thought of some weird back room with a bunch of, you know, church ladies <laughs> that they were going to throw me in with. You're just motorboating like, all these church ladies in a back room. I, just like, <laughs> I think I'll just take cash. I'm, I'm okay. I just like, what the hell? It It, it is kind of weird. The whole, the whole love offering thing. I, we, we've been given a few love offerings in our, in our day. I bet you have, but you've been offered lots of love offerings. Mm. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> When, okay, so when you said Footprints poem, it always reminds me of like my favorite version of the Footprints poem is where it's like, you know, there's there's two sets of footprints on the beach and all of a sudden there was one set of footprints and uh, somebody somebody modified the uh, the poem at the end to where they're like, and I, and I noticed there was only one set of foot, footprints and I asked God why there was only one set of footprints and God said... The sand people travel single file to hide their number. <laughs> I laughed about that for a week. Oh my God. Cause it's my two favorite things, spiritual journey right. and star Wars. Nice. Nice. Yeah. So anyway, there's that. 
Well, well, I want to thank you for all the great music that you provide for me to play with. I mean, that's one of my favorite parts of putting Bubble and Squeak together. Once I like have it all figured out, I'm like, okay, let me go through the catalog. What am I going to listen to? What will I include? And it's it's been spot on every time. Dude, I'm so glad to hear that. I can't wait to I can't wait to upload this new record that we just finished. It's like it is all the things we were talking about at the top of the hour. It is really, really angry at the church and angry at my childhood experiences kind of songs. And then it's like the first half of the record is that it's kind of a breaking up with, um, with the church or with my ideas and my thoughts about religion and spirituality and my experiences as a kid. Um, and then the next half of the record is like, okay, let's just party. (laughs) So <laughs> there's all like just silly and over the top and fun. It's perfect for bubble and squeak. Yeah. Yeah. Well, thank you so much for coming on 11 D life and sharing with everyone your, your passions and what you do because you do it so well. And uh, yeah, I can't wait for everybody to check out your, check out your show. Yeah. And now that I have your phone number, you never know. You might get a prank phone call from some weirdo and you don't know who it is. <laughs> now I'm just, I'm answering every telemarketer now. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> That's awesome. Well, thank you so much, Peterson. I, I hope that we have a chance to, uh, to do this again very soon. Sounds good. Thank you so much. It's been great being on the show. 11 Life 